exploitation. Uh, I'm Lisa Sin, the co-convener of OxbHR, which is a network group of the Bonavera Institute of Human Rights at Oxford. And if this is your first OxbHR event, welcome. I think we are in for a treat today. Um, I've been really looking forward to this. It's my pleasure to welcome Kelly Becker and Jen Larry from the Canadian Cannabis Education Guild, who are working at the cutting edge of this movement to rid modern slavery of exploitation. Um, and it's a really sort of newly de decriminalized industry. So we're very interested to hear what they've got to say. Um, thank you both for getting up so early for us. Um, we also have Jessica Steinberg with us as facilitator today. Jessica is an industry expert. She's a consultant and a scholar on cannabis legalization and commercialization. And on top of all of this, she's doing her DPhil at Oxford. Um, thanks for doing this, Jess. So the session will run for about 30 minutes today as a conversation between Jess, Jen and Kelly. Um, please feel to, free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the discussion, and then we will address them at the second portion of um, our time together. So I should um, also mention that the speakers are really keen to continue the conversation offline with our audience. So please do submit your email address in the chat function if you wish to engage beyond today's seminar with them. Um, but we will aim to close at the latest by 1.45 p.m. Uh, UK time. So without further ado, um, no more from me. I'll hand the mic over to Jess. Thank you very much, Jess and Kelly and Jen. Amazing, thank you so much for putting this together, Lisa, Jen and Kelly, it is amazing to see you. We met originally, Jen and I in Jamaica, Kelly and I in Thailand. But Kelly and I connected when I was in Colombia conducting field work for my DPhil, which explores the process of policymaking through the lens of cannabis legalization and commercialization. So our journey is all over the world. It already brings together so many global experiences and experts and people um, and really a network and supply chains, which is what we'll really tap into today. You guys will definitely do better introductions about yourself than I can do for you. A quick one about me, as Lisa has already said, I am a DPhil student here at Oxford. Um, I'm an anthropologist as well. And so my ethnographic research led to actually doing a lot of consulting work. So I started a consultancy called The Global Sea back in 2018. Alongside my field work, I realized there was a lack of women within the space, which is amazing to work alongside two incredible women here. But in the general industry, there's definitely a lack of that. So I started a women's empowerment network called Entourage, and we host monthly events where we get together, provide tools and resources for women to really engage and explore the legal cannabis market here in the UK and the EU. Uh, but definitely enough about me. I'm going to pass it over to Jen and Kelly. Tell us how you got here. Why are, you, why are we talking about modern slavery? How did you get to cannabis? How did they even come together? <laughs> Thanks, Jess. Um, well, it actually started with one moment, which is how every profoundly life-changing experience really starts. I was at the Human Rights uh, Film Festival here in Toronto, watching a film called Ghost Fleet, a documentary that follows this group around Thailand called the Labour Protection Network. And they have spent 15 years rescuing victims in Southeast Asia who have been kidnapped, smuggled, enslaved. Uh, primarily in the seafood sector, agriculture and construction industries. And I felt so triggered that this was going on um, across all industries. We know about, you know, what potentially is happening in fashion and food, but just to really think that this was happening at such a mass level and governments and corporations were aware, I was so bothered. So I reached out and um, after leaving, corporate cannabis in Canada. I ended up starting um, the Cannabis Education Guild with Jen and found myself educating my way through Asia and going to meet them in Thailand. And what I learned from them and what I saw was forever life-changing. They have been rescuing victims for 15 years. The numbers are going up year after year. The government response in Thailand has been to actually ban the documentary from from the country you can't even watch the trailer on youtube so there really is no consumer education there about it and uh the from a corporate level like we're talking about the largest conglomerates in the world you know they've thrown them some kind of pity money and it the, the response has been beyond uh devastating so 
in thinking about cannabis as one of the fastest growing industries of today, it was only like a, a matter of moments where I just had to say to them, you guys will be rescuing people in 10 years from the fields, from the factories. It's no different. It's going to be the largest consumer packaged goods industry of the next decade. And today is the smallest it will ever be. So uh, as much as we're going to dive into what we're doing at a policy level and where we hope to be with the industry and with corporations, what I'm really most proud about is that we were able to bring on a hire in Thailand to work with the Labor Protection Network and begin educating them about the industry so that as they go to the migrant communities and the border towns around Thailand, they can actually start to explain the risks in the supply chain, what a legal operation looks like and you know, protect themselves. Because these are people who are coming to Thailand thinking you know, it's, it's New York, it's London, it's the, the opportunity where we're finally gonna be able to make money. And you know, they're, they're often deceived and you know, taken advantage of at the uh, price that we, we get to pay for cheap goods. So uh, I was lucky enough to be able to bring Jen on my second trip where we really made this commitment in February to them that we were going to not only support them uh, in a grassroots capacity with education, but take it to the next level because policy needs to come into play for a bigger change because Canada in time will surely be importing goods from Thailand as they were the first country in Asia to legalize two years ago. Amazing, incredible journey. Um, it's incredible how you guys both came together as well. So I'll pass it back to you, Jen, to share a bit about how you got here and if you can also touch upon some of the key stats or figures about the global cannabis market so we can also frame that within this context. Sure. Um, well, thank you again for having us. And uh, yeah, I guess as Kelly said, you know, this, I guess this started as far as a journey, unbeknownst to me, I will be honest uh, completely that, that we were ever going to go here. But um, uh, Kelly and I, when she was, uh, I've been working for the last uh, four years as a, a commercial strategist uh, focused specifically on the cannabis and hemp space. Um, and uh, Kelly and I had an opportunity to speak at an Ivy school in uh, London, Ontario. And uh, it was there through her presentation where she had actually put up a slide. And, um, you know, I guess like anybody who's in human rights, we're extremely passionate, but at times, you know, we're heretics because we have to have these grandiose notions of how we can really change the world. And, you know, Kelly's hypothesis was that cannabis can actually change the world. Um, at the time, we were not working together, but in my uh, business, um, I was given an opportunity through a client to kind of dive into education, which uh, I'm sure, you know, of course, speaking to uh, such a prestigious academic body, we all know how important education is, and, and particularly in this industry, which is so nascent. And so um, I actually reached out to Kelly and, you know, thankfully convinced her that uh, using her social impact skills and, and you know, to building something with me that wasn't only you know, focused on education but social good would probably allow us to kind of be the change that we'd like to see. And that's kind of how we, we define this idea of becoming a social enterprise and not only launching a platform that provides pretty robust commercial cannabis education, but more to the point, um, you know, leverages the funds to now really make this change and, and create like a sector that can do it differently. So um, as she said, when we decided to kind of move away from just North America and move into the international space, uh, while we had all, as you mentioned, just kind of traveled abroad and seen things, uh, it really was eye-opening uh, when we got to go to Asia, specifically Thailand, and have the permission from the Labor Protection Network uh, where we were allowed to kind of include them in our in our case studies and in our learnings and in our betas and so maybe we'll get into that a little bit more but that's really how this came to be i think it was extraordinarily organic and super poignant um, for for today's time and more importantly for what we're solving for the future um, and to your other question i think from a kind of where are we and what does it mean for cannabis well um, if i think about just you know four years ago um, we in Canada probably had 30 license holders that were allowed to even grow cannabis. And today we have over 600 licensed producers. Um, 
we had uh, prior to Canada coming online as like a first federally legal country that would adopt medical and um, adult use. We saw different countries, but of course it was maybe a handful. Um, and then today, you know, we have over 60 countries around the world and growing. Um, and I'm sure, you know, we'll get into a little bit more, but I think the key thing is, is that as we've watched cannabis really uh, grow, it's, it's begun to segment itself. And so now we're seeing the commercial space really step up and throw out, you know, the billion and trillion dollar markers of what this category is really going to be worth. So, um, it never ceases to amaze me um, that cannabis is a discussion, one that is moving into a place of you know, positive sentiment and, and normalization. Um, and certainly it uh, is a huge honor for us to kind of continue to ride that wave and disrupt it with a far more important discussion, which is, is human rights. Yeah, it, it really is incredible how quick the process of reform has happened. I know when I started my research in 2015 for my undergrad, it was four states in the US and now every time that there's a voting round going on, state by state by state, and everyone just says all these states are coming online and then you have different countries. Every time I'm writing a new draft, I have to just change the edit with a little asterisk, five new countries. And it's, it's incredible. And then even being here in the UK and you know, well, it is known that the UK is the largest producer of medical cannabis in the world, yet we have less than a dozen, let's say, patients that are even registered on the NHS. And so there's already these paradoxes that go from the supply chain to the policies to the patients and, and a lot of intricacies and the complexities of that. Um, so I think that's where we should go next with this conversation about how does modern slavery even become a concern within such a new nascent market? And where, where does that concern fall? Is it already taking the shape of other sectors, whether that's tobacco and other forms of agricultural crops, uh, fashion, things like that? So how has this process from going from legalization into commercialization, where are we going wrong or are we going right? <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, I think just to give a little bit of background on some of the history of what's going on maybe in the illicit market. So cannabis was always a part of society since 2700 BC, and it really wasn't until modern times, this war on drugs, where we started to you know, separate ourselves from the plant, whether that's in a food, fiber, medicine capacity. And so, you know, this shift uh, with a lot of propaganda and, and, and new learnings that had come in and changed people's perspective um, is recent. And it wasn't until the 60s, 70s, when people were bringing genetics from Amsterdam into North America, that we started to see this growing underground movement, and not only in North America, as well as countries all around the world. So one of the major red flags for us in specifically doing our beta in Thailand is that's the region of the Golden Triangle. And that area produces hundreds and hundreds of kilograms per week, um, just trafficking cannabis all around the world, as well as areas in Central Asia. Uh, Mexico obviously is a hotbed. And these are spots where there's violence and already um, huge amounts of people enslaved, children in farms, people being trafficked and exploited. So as we're seeing in the North American market, people from the legacy market are certainly joining the industry and that's fabulous, but how do we prevent those bad practices from coming into the legal market? While at the same time, we're seeing other sectors jump into cannabis, whether that's food, tobacco, um, food, tobacco, fashion. And we're also aware that now, you know, they already in their legal space are using horrific practices uh, against the humans that they employ around the world. So with, you know, this happening in the illicit market and in legal sectors and cannabis having this agricultural supply chain where, you know, the, the biomass that's needed doesn't have standards right now. We have standards in this extraction part of the, the supply chain, the post-processing part, but not really in what comes in because a lot of mold or whatever can be removed. So the fear is that, you know, cannabis is going to be another ingredient 
that's going to be sourced from the global south at pennies on the gram. So that yeah. is another red flag for us. Yeah, and I, you know, I'll, I'll just extend to what Kelly's saying because I think just to your point to the supply chain is that, you know, the the thing that's so interesting about mature industries is oftentimes people who work in the industry are unaware of what the operations really entail, mm -hmm. but certainly of where the supply uh, comes from, and 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 how it was, um, I guess you know, allotted or, or, or grown or developed. And I think what really was a trigger for us, uh, you know, to support what Kelly was saying outside of the practices that happen in countries where climates, um, you know, kind of allow this type of, you know, conditions to continue to occur, where we can have so many people in the fields, we really realized that the supply chain was only half the problem because the chain of custody is the other half. And that's where the flags really started to go up for us. Um, and to continue to even pull on Kelly's points, I think when we put a lens on the trafficking or the, um, I guess, labor exploitation that is happening in the commercial sectors, um, we definitely see it, its prominence across the board in warehouses and manufacturing plants in the fields. But what we're certainly seeing, what was very interesting for us, what is what we're now calling, I guess, modern slavery. And that was the other flag. Even in our own backyard, we're seeing companies that are you know uh, paying less to certain types of employees are certainly um you know lowering the type of conditions that people should have so it got us very nervous that when an industry grows as fast as cannabis is now growing albeit you know it's been 30 years maybe almost a little less since the california really moved into compassion and you know started to legalize you know to heal people um it's really the next 30 years so we are really concerned that um, practices from the illegal market practices from the corporate market which exists already will just continue because of the forces that actually force companies to cut corners uh, constantly move into shortcuts and think about how to lower their cost per good so they can actually compete in the market. And so we just imagine that cannabis will, uh, will, will echo all of these problems and maybe introduce some new ones if we don't really look at how we can take business as usual and, and change it into a more fit for purpose uh, way of the future. Right. It's, it's the type of thing that it's crazy to me that history just continues to repeat itself. It's when I was doing my field work in Columbia, I saw this hands on when Columbia had just legalized for medical purposes. And I was experiencing the transition from an illicit market to an illicit market, but guerrillas were still coming in and the paramilitary were coming in really next to a legal, um, facility that had all the right paperwork but there is still bribery going on and so it, it makes sense that practices from the illegal, illegal market would still be coming into the legal one and then when that type of product for such low cost of land and labor and other forms of exploitation come into it that's really where i began to experience kind of a distortion of reality from what was happening in the industry to what was happening on the ground and then it was so far removed from the final product that a consumer would be getting at a dispenser in the US or even at a pharmacy here in the UK because you can get it at Holland and Barrett and Boots and really, really mainstream retail shops nowadays. And so on, the, on one hand, it's this compounded effect of policy after policy, but then stigma and then this cross intersectionality of all the sectors that are coming together. So I'd love to dive a bit deeper into kind of these compounded effects, what people might not be aware of when it comes to cannabis, but also kind of this disruption that is happening or how cannabis could be used as a disruptor to different forms of modern slavery that are also taking place. Um, so whatever your thoughts are on, on that. Uh, well, you know, I, I guess I would love to start, Kel, if that's okay. You know, listening to chat, Jess, it, it unfortunately triggered um, probably one of the toughest days for me when we were traveling abroad, which was a moment where we had a cup of coffee with uh, somebody from Myanmar. And, uh, you know, obviously the step, the first step in anything is learning. And so we were having this discussion and just trying to understand exactly this, like, how is cannabis going to impact, you know, Myanmar? And, 
Uh, it's important to note that cannabis and hemp uh, fall under the same species. And so while they're potentially classified differently and are used, one in an industrial purpose, one in a drug variety, the crop in general, and I think that's what we're really at the place discussing, um, is impacting all nations. And so when we started to discuss with this individual from Myanmar, and I said to him, what is your biggest fear? Like, what, what are the things that really concern you? What, what right now are the top two commodities that are exported from Myanmar? And how can we look at those in reflection? And his answer stopped me dead. And if I, it, it absolutely changed my life. And he said, the two things that we export from Myanmar are humans and jade. Um, and when he said that, it was really sad for me because he then followed it up with the idea that the military runs those borders that the governments are very aware of the practices that are happening and so his fear is it has no boundary he is so concerned that as this crop comes in as it demonstrates economic potential as it allows for countries to think about how they're now going to create new trade agreements become leaders in exports um, you know, leverage certain things, um, how devastating that will be because it could potentially be equal to or worse than the reality. And, you know, again, just to express it, 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 it never goes away when someone tells you in that order that their top two export commodities are humans and jade. And so, you know, I think that that really just kind of paints the picture of how the problem is so severe, where the governments are holding the people down. Um, how policy, even with the activists trying to move forward, even with individuals coming forward, even with the UN um, and, you know, the FDA trying to create standards, how um, difficult it is to really implement them. And so from getting seeds to, you know, being able to farm a crop to being able to harvest and to house and warehouse a crop, being able to distribute it, uh, you know, in the same capacity that every other business, there isn't a point that wouldn't be under scrutiny. The crop is like gold. It is so valuable. So even what can happen along the route for it to, from it to get to A to B could be problematic. And of course, there's no preventative measures for any of this to really, um, you know, assign responsibility or create a declaration that ensures everybody that this particular, you know, crop was safe based on the standards that we're talking about today, which is, you know, human quality and, and they're not being some kind of, of trafficking. And that's just before we even get to the manufacturing plants or of course the ports or the airport where it now speaks to that whole disconnected chain of custody because now we're on another continent and it's as though all of those steps were of no value. So I think from as simple as on the ground, um, with just everyday people being very concerned that they have no chance, to the you know, people being held down and forced to, again, work in conditions that are prevalent in other uh, industries, to the realities of you know, countries and governments becoming even more aggressively hungry as we're trying to get out of what now we're seeing as a very difficult economic time in our lifetime. Just to add to that, um, yeah, humans and Jade forever changed my life as well. Uh, but I think, you know, because there are certain countries, um, specifically in the global south, like in Africa, that are just legalizing for export purposes, and we're seeing certain countries coming on just importing, there's this rush for a commodity, which is obviously triggering to supply chains being built really rapidly, carelessly, and like Jen said, corners being cut. So I think, you know, there's uh, extra incentive as these frameworks are being built to consider what that cannabis slavery, anti-slavery policy in an act will look like today rather than in 10 years from now. So we're really all about driving this preventative mechanism. Yeah, it's cannabis always seems to be something that either brings people together or pulls people apart. And some of the work that I do at the UN for the Commission on Narcotic Drugs for the drug policy meetings, it's very apparent how emotional cannabis is. And I think that emotional aspect really ties into some of the way the, pol some of the 
frameworks in which the policies are made. But then also because of the reasons like Kelly, you have just said about why cannabis is even being legalized in the first place. And if it's for exportation, it can very easily become for exploitation as well. And that's where the conflict really arises, especially when the policymakers are not really driven by rationality or fact or evidence on what the cannabis plant is and and they still have the myth and the taboo and the stigma and a lot of other factors when it comes to policy making um but before we i got on a tangent about that i want to see what other solutions you're offering and suggesting and and really how you propose to work on something like this where all of the sectors seem to be coming into one what is the ultimate way? How does cannabis kind of offer a solution? What, what yeah, what do you guys think about that one? Um, just, at, just at a high level, before Jen will dive into our specific strategies, um, you know, we as a nascent sector really have the opportunity of building something new, setting a global precedent. And kind of, as I just said, because these frameworks are being built today, we don't need to have a separate bill that governs labor exploitation and slavery, rather it can be something that's within the sector. So learning from fast food, fast fashion, fast pharma, there is this terrible, you know, tolerated, accepted behavior that's gone on because, you know, uh, certain brands outsource their manufacturing overseas and they use a third party recruiter and the don't ask, don't tell mentality has gone on for too long. So when examining the um, serious backpedaling that these sectors have had to do now, you know, is how Jen and I came to our conclusion of what we recommend as a sector-based approach. Yeah, so thanks, Kel, for that, like, setup. I guess just, you know, it's interesting. I've spent the better part of the last 20 years being, um, I guess, more in the corporate world. Um, I've always been, um, I guess, I've lived a life that has, you know, I'm trying to be socially impactful in a positive way, but certainly as we kind of stepped into this arena, it just commanded so much of our attention in research and looking into what is already in place, what had already been done. So, uh, if, you know, let me just start with that, that like what we did, what we've designed as a proposed strategy is really coming off the heels of looking at the extensive work the UN has done. You know, we started this journey looking at the SDGs. We then siloed and, you know, kind of honed in on the eighth SDG specifically, where in 8.7, it speaks to the labor components. Um, and then through that and through our, you know, our advisory group and, you know, the individuals that we were speaking with, it was clear that it, it doesn't directly address the criminality of the actions that go into it. So, you know, we first thought it would be fantastic. Why don't we appeal to the UN and try and introduce a new SDG? And then through our um, ongoing research, uh, much to our dismay, the adoption of the SDGs, the effectiveness of the SDGs, um, while they're super important and, and create a beautiful framework, are not necessarily moving the needle. And then the compound effect of then the global compact and guiding principles and different organizations who are feverishly working towards trying to inspire corporations to have different guidelines and look towards this. Um, we, we started to realize that, you know, even the global compact is nervous that the goals for 2030 will not be met because of the lack of integration or real um, impact that's coming from the businesses that are trying to move it forward. We've then, in adding to that, found out that when we looked at some of the bills that had already been in existence in different um, countries, you have to, I think in the UK, um, you're only held accountable if your business makes 40 million or more. And, you, you know, in Canada and the US, you have to make a half a billion or more where you start to really have to adhere to some type of reporting or some type of responsibility when it comes to labor exploitation and how your business is running. So in our, I guess, assessment of it, we realized that, you know, asking for another SDG or trying to create another, you know, idea that, you know, would shine, that people could jump onto, would just in our humble opinion, would be ineffective. And so we thought that going back to our, the earlier part of our discussion, that supporting the supply chain is everything. 
supporting the chain of custody for us was the next stage. And the only way that we can supersede jurisdiction, the only way that we could actually create something that would afford a sector to have a standard is if in our case, the Cannabis Act, which is what governs the Canadian marketplace and how operators can uh, operate everything from the packaging they can have to what is on their labels, to the way that their facilities need to be monitored and reported, um, what an opportunity of a lifetime for us to try and appeal to them to integrate a slavery bill, a amendment, a you know, section directly into the act that would take a position as a sector and say, if you are working in the cannabis sector and you have to adhere to the Cannabis Act, the act explicitly expresses that modern slavery in all of its you know, capacities and all of its forms is not permitted. It is an illegal action in the cannabis sector. And so that is our strategy to really try and take um, the Canadian Cannabis Act and hopefully use it and, and this effort as an inspiration to others around the world who might think of appealing to their governments and having an act govern more than just packaging and labeling and marketing, but rather actually a space where human rights is far more important than business rights. So in doing that with our boots on the ground initiative, which Kelly mentioned, having someone placed and going to migrant towns and having this beta, we're hoping that we can bridge the gap uh, both in parliament, you know, from parliament all the way down to the communities, but through a new strategy that would afford all of the efforts that have come so far from the major organizations to really get the momentum they need to, to create this change. Yeah, the, the sector based is so fascinating because if you are able to set that precedent moving forward for emerging markets, what does that say when those acts might come into play as well? Um, but looking at it from multiple perspectives and where pressure might need to come from, I'm curious to understand if you think where, where the most success really would be. So is it that the consumers need to be more involved? Is it from the licensed producers, the LPs in Canada or some of the multi-state operators, MSOs over in the U.S.? Do they need to have the commitment? Is it really policymakers? Are there lobbying um, associations? Where is, is it all of them? Like, where does the pressure need to come in order for something like this to actually materialize for you guys? It's definitely all of the above and more, but um, in doing our research, like Jen mentioned, the gaping hole that we found was that there's no commercial application um, or any type of incentivization for companies to really bring themselves on and implement it, embed it into their operations. So if they don't have any type of penalty or you know, they're not held accountable like they are for errors in packaging and marketing and labeling, then why would they need to if they're not being governed accordingly? And uh, it's been very promising in our early conversations with some of the major licensed producers here in Canada. They are very on board to join us um, in taking this letter of recommendations to the Canadian government and standing behind us. Uh, they you know, are in their early stages of international expansion. And so it's a really uh, timely moment for us to get the industry on board because that's where we've seen these uh, other initiatives fall short where they're, they're kind of a menu style option where you choose what works for your business and you know, you're not held accountable. And if the businesses that are held accountable are only you know, turning over 40 million and higher, then like that doesn't really include any of the cannabis businesses right now. Um, and I'll say, you know, Jess, it's interesting your question. If I put on my marketer's hat, the greatest change of life comes from the consumer, the people, when they rally, when they scream, when they, when they yell just loud enough, and that's why we're even on the call today, because we had enough of those people go up to each and every one of their governments and insist that cannabis stop being seen as, you know, uh, you know, a, a war, a, you know, and a drug that kills, but rather be embraced as a plant that potentially offers a lot of solutions to society. So, you know, um, we are working on a global petition right now that will be launched in the new year where we hope to gather global voices to help 
uh, where possible. We know that, um, well, at least we've been told, you know, petitions don't always go that far, um, but we'd like to allow voices to kind of impact our governments. But to really go back to what Kelly's saying, I think, you know, in watching, and I can speak for Canada, and maybe you can even jump in for the UK, and watching the way the Cannabis Act is unrolled, uh, as rolled out, you know, because the people who were building policy had not consumed cannabis, did come with a sentiment which was more fear-based than, um, you know, embracing, had never really run commercial entities, so they didn't understand the severity of, of piecemealing uh, a rollout and the impact that that has on businesses, which in our opinion is directly why the public markets opened up so quickly, exactly why dead stocks were flipped. We're talking about mining stocks and, you know, uh, technology stocks that were dead that had a certain ilk of individual running them that was able to continue on the stock market because they needed to raise such large capital in order to manage the realities that the governments have put in. So I'd say at the end of the day, whether we love the rules or not, when a government takes a position to protect their people and they create policy that absolutely does that, no different than a no smoking sign on the side of the road, a stop sign when you're driving your, you know, your car, we cannot change behavior unless it is top down. We will see the change happen from the bottom up, but we need it to come from the top down. And while I have no opinion about our prime minister, our prime minister legalized an industry and has stepped away and had no presence in it since. And um, we passed the Cannabis Act, probably the fastest bill in Canadian history. And so I hope that we get an opportunity to be considered by our government for them to realize how important it is to pass this. Um, I know that you guys have some stuff going on and maybe you can speak in turn. You know, we haven't had a modern slavery bill pass yet. We've had two senators who have proposed it in 2018 and 2020 and at both times, um, it's kind of been dismissed. I don't know if that's for a lack of understanding how to integrate that into um, the law or a lack of being able to put people before politics. But uh, maybe, you know, let's just have the, the banter for a sec. You guys are such a huge producer because you have a large company in London, but also you've recently passed this uh, position on CBD. And so, um, like, where do you see the biggest change coming from, I guess, in your region, as far as what's really affecting change? Is it the people or the government taking stance? Yeah, I mean, from a British perspective, the reason that cannabis was legalized for medical purposes back in November 2018 was more from the people's perspective, I guess, because there was, which is similar to many countries around the world, where there's a story about a mother with a child typically it is epilepsy, that captures the hearts of the public because it becomes a cry for human rights. And this was the case here with Billy Caldwell, who he actually came to Canada to get his cannabis medicine. Um, it was confiscated at Heathrow Airport. He went straight into the hospital because he needed his medicine that included THC, um, which is at the time it was still illegal in the UK for medical purposes. And then he went into ICU and then finally the home office made a switch within days. And so similar to how the Cannabis Act was the fastest in Canadian history, perhaps, I think it was, I don't know for a fact, but I think it must be one of the fastest uh, legal shifts in British time as well. And then the conversation has kind of stalled a bit because Brexit and COVID <laughs> and many other topics that come into play. But um, there's a lot of hesitation from doctors. and so in order to prescribe it, they need to be educated. They really want the stigma to go away. They need to understand it. They need consistent supply chain, stuff like that. But from a CBD, which is the, the non-psychotropic compound, one of the non-psychotropic compounds in cannabis, that really factors into the wellness market, which I still think is pretty driven by a public society view on what's going on um, because the government hasn't really been enforcing it at all. So there's less of a regulatory framework there. Um, so the regulatory frameworks are very different, but definitely the processes to get them there have been a contribution of, um, there were f some like think tank policy uh, groups that came together to get that ball rolling. 
plus the stories with the media and then the public really demanding it. So I think it definitely is a combination of all of those, um, which actually leads to a question from someone in the audience about, so her question is, does only Canada have a legal framework for cannabis? Um, and I guess we can look at that from a national level. In the US, obviously, we look at that at a state level because it's illegal at the federal. Um, and then her second question about that is, how would you lobby to push other states to adopt one similar to how Canada is? Um, okay, so I guess to the first point uh, from, uh, there are other countries that have federally legalized Uruguay as an example, but from the G7, I think what made Canada so fascinating is that we have federal legalization for two completely different streams, one that we deem access to cannabis for medical purposes, and the other which is access to cannabis for adult use or recreational purposes. Um, I guess, and Kelly, I'll let you jump in and what your thoughts are. I would say though, to the second part of the question, um, hindsight is 2020 and no, I would not encourage other countries to cut and paste the Cannabis Act from Canada. I think, um, you know, it is rare as Canadians that we are leaders because of our size in the world, but certainly it is the first time where everybody will have learned on our dime. Um, and I, you know, I don't say that with any negativity, but I think the importance of standardization is also contextualizing what that means to a country and where you can adopt the best practices that come through um, any, you know, new structure, guideline, framework, standard, whatever we're calling it. Um, but uh, I think where Canada has really led the way is a demonstration. We have provinces so that we're able to govern on a provincial level, a municipal level, and on a federal level. And somehow, even though it's still you know, disconnected, it's working and people aren't going to prison and people are for the most part able to, in a safe and responsible way, access products for their specific needs. And on a global level, uh, there was recent news that Mexico might be the third country to join in a federal legalization. And uh, like Jen said, when we were educating in, we, we were very privileged to meet with some different government leaders in Asia, we, we highly discouraged them from copying what Canada had done because people can't believe we still can't access cannabis in the pharmacy. And that although federal legalization has made it much more accessible, there's still a problem with people getting the right product, um, especially patients and especially those most vulnerable in remote areas. So we have not nailed it down at all. We're almost the beta for the world. Um, and I think that the, the countries who are really taking their time to evaluate all of the different frameworks, um, but really adopt some, one that fits their people, their land, um, and their other frameworks that exist for the pharmaceutical industry and, and natural medicines uh, should be implemented because there is no cut and paste solution right now. Right. Um, and I'll just, I wanna just jump back in there for a second because you know, Kelly mentioned that we had some travels and you know, we we're, were talking about policy a bit and how to impact it. And I think it also comes with understanding the pain points of the individuals who have the uh, responsibility to shift policy. Um, we spoke with the Minister of Health in Malaysia and, you know, when you think about the health crisis in a country, it's very hard for them to prioritize cannabis um, and certainly for them to understand should they lean in through hemp and industrial purposes, should they, you know, go for the gold. Uh, we often refer to cannabis as like a chemical factory. Uh, its potential is, is really undiscovered yet. Um, and so, you know, the, the stresses and the concerns that came from a health minister are so different than those that come from a minister of land and water and agriculture, which is, I'm sure, a whole other topic we can have. But um, I bring it up because, you know, then we found ourselves sitting with the Korean FDA. And it was really in that moment where we realized that everything's about to change when the United States of America and the FDA go into federal legalization. And it's why we feel now is such an important time to really tackle this, because the war on drugs lost and the import export game that is about to occur, the shifting that will happen um, from a, a storage and distribution perspective where countries that have been leaders, economic leaders for the last decades will now see new countries potentially because of the value of this crop, you know, pop up. So while it's a little away from your question, I think it speaks volumes to why it is important to take many frameworks. It's the goal, I guess, of, you know, if we can inspire our country to do something, 
with an act and then a task force can result from that or the, or the UN more importantly can um, assign an objective that a task force happen from multiple countries that have similar goals uh, and that goal of course being human rights there's a real opportunity now to maybe learn from the Canadian Cannabis Act if we change it, but also come together and figure out how we're gonna take these learnings and create future wins um, for you know, this, this kind of first ever kind of global wave where industries would like to be importing and exporting their product. And you know, as we see from Germany today, they are, being, they are very successful. They have moved through the stream. They are servicing patients. They don't have supply challenges. And they were able to do that because they took supply out of other countries, countries who were so excited to ship their product because of the global opportunity. So before Canada imports, um, we're hoping some of this you know, gets fixed, but uh, certainly I think that it would behoove all governments to consider all of the legal acts that currently exist and uh, allow their task force to evaluate them and pull out the best of, of what has been you know, placed in those. Yeah. And from a framework perspective, also just to add that it's important to clarify the distinction of Canada being legalized for all purposes, including adult use, medical, wellness, whatever that is, where some of these other countries have only legalized, as we had mentioned, for export purposes, cultivation, medical. So the frameworks are so dissimilar around the world. Um, but with that said, it means that there's still an opportunity to include in early stages of legalization a conversation about modern slavery, even if it isn't an act only about adult use uh, regulation, um, because some countries may never get there, or it might happen after our lifetime, because this process is very much ongoing, and there are definitely phases where it goes decriminalization, medical, forms of destigmatization, normalization, commercialization, all of that together. So um, yeah, I think it's really interesting that there are these different frameworks and changing slightly to another question from the audience is, are there similarities to the dynamics of another crop, rubber, um, tobacco, other ones that you guys might have experienced in your travels in, in Asia or elsewhere? I think we can certainly expect some of the same practices in you know, farming, agriculture for food, as well as uh, tobacco, as well as cotton, to be quite similar to the cannabis cultivation that will happen at large scale. And you know, upon doing our research, you know, the ILO says that currently there are 40 million people around the world enslaved today. And that does not include the 200 million children who are in forced labor. Forced labor means you're forced to do work, but you have uh, obviously your uh, parents at home with you, so you're not exactly trapped. Anyway, the 200 million children that are in forced labor today 70% of them are in agriculture and half of them are under the age of 12. So when we think about countries in Asia and Africa coming online, especially for mass export purposes, uh, it, it, it is quite fearing and, and triggering that we're going to see similar things of what's already going on um, in cotton, in tobacco and in farming. And I, th I think, you know, even if you look at uh, the trends, obviously coffee, as you mentioned, but cacao, we're seeing this and, you know, it always is about the spectrum. You know, it's coming down to this moment of conscious consumerism where we're seeing industries actually publish the fact that they're having like harm free because it was such an eye opener when we realized um, how privileged we were to be drinking that cup of coffee and what was really happening before that bean kind of filtered through into our cup. And so I would say that we have not yet seen a category that is not um, subject to this. You know, there are some interesting documentaries that I've, uh, you know, even discovered. One particularly on garlic where, um, you know, there was a, a large demand in the United States uh, for peeled garlic because I guess, you know, it's always easy. convenience seems to trump all other things sometime. And what the documentary really um, exposed was that this garlic was being peeled uh, in prisons in China by the prisoners. Um, just because they're incarcerated doesn't mean they don't have rights. This is this, this statement that we make about a slavery free industry. It's, it's to all human beings at any point. So um, I think that's why we're so 
spirited um, of, of you know, our, our position because we, we have not yet seen a moment where it isn't the situation. Obviously in the illicit market, we see cocaine. We're, we're speaking with people in Colombia and Brazil and Mexico and um, the devastation around how crops are grown, how product is transported, how goods are manufactured. Um, I think those three buckets being the key areas, um, we, we, it, it's just happening across the board. So, you know, in, in trying to shine some positive light, the fact that we've seen change, I think Kelly, there was a, I don't know if it was Nike or McDonald's, there have been examples of companies trying to right their wrongs. So we're seeing that, and I don't know if you have an example that uh, we can share, but certainly um, it's happening everywhere. Yeah, McDonald's has started to right their wrongs, uh, especially within the US where a lot of uh, the migrant workers from Mexico and Latin America have been exploited for decades. So that's a positive trend for, I guess, fast food around the world. Um, in fashion, you know, we're starting to see brands like H&M and Zara uh, implement these, you know, ethical or, or sustainable brands or lines or campaigns. We hope they're not campaigns. We hope they're here uh, for the long term. But there have, there, this has been at the expense of millions of dollars and a tainted reputation. So, yes, they are the largest brands around the world, but they've had to do uh, millions and millions of dollars of backpedaling. Interesting. Yeah. One of the things that cannabis from a campaign perspective is interesting is dating it back to the war on drugs and how it was used as a form of civil disobedience. Um, so smoking a joint would be kind of a finger to the government, for example, uh, because President Nixon's domestic affairs assistant, I believe it was, he basically said, we're um, going to target specific communities it was blacks with heroin and um, and the hippies with marijuana well he said marijuana i call it cannabis but <laughs> to directly quote him and so it's always been this politically charged crop that has changed in different forms of socialization and things like this and it also speaks to a question another question from the audience about how this relates directly to india um, his example is gandhi used to spin khadi out of hemp an act that became a marker against british rule so connecting how cannabis or hemp can be used as something that has a political symbolic meaning behind it is really fascinating and i guess for you guys to touch upon how this does relate to India and other parts that might be surrounding it, how it can be used to to change, make a statement, um, even if the statement is just going into law, but also some of the symbolic meaning behind it as well. I, you know, I'll just say this. I think the key consideration here is like what the statement needs to be. You know, as you spoke to the earlier point that certain gestures were seen as rebellion, the key moment in time is for cannabis and the individuals who want to advocate for its evolution is to maybe uh, change the way they're trying to make statements. Um, I think that, you know, plants, uh, the spirituality of the plant, the holistic nature of the plant, the integration in whether it's Ayurvedic medicine or in fibers that are, you know, more durable for the reality of people's lives. I think getting to the deeper point of how it is meaningful, how it is purposeful in our lives, how we can replace commodities that have damaged the planet, how we can move into a regenerative space, how we can support economic uh, growth, how we can help um, you know, reduce harm in general of individuals, or more importantly, improve their lives. Um, I think if we really look back into the scriptures, if we really look at the way that they made statements, they made statements that weren't about trying to prove others wrong, but rather to like create good and create rights because it was survival. So when we think about India, um, which we're very blessed to actually, you know, speak with corporations in India that are leading right now, uh, specifically in hemp and hemp, which is being used as a replacement for Kevlar and military jackets to be used in maybe, um, you know, uh, mechanisms when you, uh, like, what are they called? Ear, uh, not Hearing earphones. Aids. Hearing aids. Thank you, Kel. Um, these are the larger statements to demonstrate to governments how this crop can actually be transformed. Um, 
and how, and, and I think this goes back to very much how people will now move through the transformation, how they will approach the crop with a sense of gentility, with the natural ethos that the plant has. These are the statements that we need the governments to see. And the governments need to see individuals like, you know, us, individuals who are, you know, le leading lives where we're trying to put our best foot forward, where we're doing good, where we're paying our taxes, where our statements are really for the greater good and not just for the purpose of rebelling against the law. So I hope that doesn't seem, you know, insensitive, but I think what an opportunity for us now to really reconsider what a statement is. And I think in India, they have shared with us, you know, there are a lot of thoughts because some people are, um, you know, able to operate because there are parts of the leaf and there are products that are, you know, all over India and they're using them. And I think it speaks to the intelligence of the commercial entities and how they understand the law and how the plant affords us an opportunity to deconstruct it and use it in certain ways. Um, but we're definitely hearing that it is a very challenging time also in India because the lawmakers have not necessarily moved forward and the areas that can grow are still very undereducated. Um, and you know they get influence from many different regions, but they're very you know, self-contained in the way that they're going to take a decision for their people. Uh, but they are front and center on this. And when they do decide to legalize fully, um, I think we're going to see an explosive movement around the world because they will kind of revive this idea of where cannabis can play a role in medicine. And I know I'm personally very excited for that. All right, so I'm just looking at the questions, which ones we have time for as well. Um, we have, this one's quite interesting and I think Kelly and I have spoken about it before. Can we apply a gender lens to the supply chain of cannabis and the available tools for equality of distribution and consumption? So really focusing on, from my experience, where the woman factor into this um, and how there is inequalities. I mean, my own experience, had, how I have already stated from the beginning with Entourage Network is that there is a gender imbalance. But when you look at the cultivation side, there also is a gender imbalance. So curious to hear your thoughts on a gender lens for the supply chain. Well, it's, I guess it's hard to say because there are a lot of markets, um, especially like in Africa and South America, which we have yet to visit. Uh, but definitely just even in seeing what's going on in North America, the um, upper management is definitely predominantly white male and the people working in production are predominantly um, immigrants and migrant workers. So we're seeing that gap already exist here. Uh, we also are worried that, you know, what's going on in specifically indigenous communities, like in Thailand, there's a group called the Hmong in the Northern Thailand areas where they grow uh, hemp for textile purposes, who are already at great risk of being exploited. So indigenous communities as well have been using cannabis for a multitude of reasons for thousands of years and uh, they seem to be very vulnerable to uh, being exploited in the supply chain. You know, Jess, I think the gender uh, aspect is uh, not exclusive to cannabis. I think it is a discussion that uh, is happening around the world and, you know, we, as women, um, we've certainly had the opportunity to, you know, take great leadership roles in the world. We've been prime ministers, we've been presidents of countries, we continue to lead in organizations. Um, I definitely think what, what my takeaway has been is that, you know, when a, when a new industry emerges, it's natural for, I guess, seasoned veterans to be brought in. And to date, most of those seasoned players, um, you know, were men, but I, I'd like to kind of extend on that, that I think it's the, it's the business principles that they grew with that are creating the problems. And, you know, we had this discussion on another panel, which was about, should there be more women in the boardroom? And I think the conclusion was, there should be more compassion in the boardroom. And that oftentimes what's associated with women, as it should be, is that there's a gentility. There is an ability for emotion to exist in between profit. 
And I think that as we continue to see the diversity grow in the industry, hopefully that will include not only our gender and the color of our skin, but our way of thinking. And I think that's really what's missing in the cannabis industry because so much of it has been propelled off of a venture narrative. The first couple of years in cannabis almost had nothing to do with cannabis. It had everything to do with public markets. So I think that involving women, involving community, involving voices that aren't often given an opportunity to weigh in at a decision taking time is where we're going to see tremendous change and hopefully where we're going to create, um, I mean, a greater opportunity for all of us who want to wake up every day and contribute and work, but certainly, you know, an opportunity to think differently and, and take you know, create businesses and brands that are governed not just by old school thinking, but by new ways of thinking. And obviously, uh, you know, that includes women and uh, proudly I'm one, so. Yeah, it is, I think you're right. It's about bringing that compassion to, to the room, um, which is not exclusive to women, but to, to humanity in general. Um, we have one final question, which curious to hear your thoughts on this. If we need to identify companies for naming and shaming, does that work? For example, is the body shop and their use of hemp, and I'm sure there's quite a few more examples over in the US and Canada. Um, how do you really figure out where they are sourcing? So I guess it's a question of transparency. I mean, great question. I think that's exactly where we are. It's about putting together a supply chain slash chain of custody that allows, whether it's the consumer, I mean, the consumer or the individual, to spot check, to 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 feel a sense of comfort that the materials have been sourced in a way that um, you know are humane and that don't compromise the user in any way. Um, I personally think that positivity always, uh, you know, uh, takes out negativity. And I don't think that shaming the industries, we've seen it happen already. The papers tried to take down H&M. They've talked about Nike. And as Kelly mentioned about McDonald's, all the corporations will do, thankfully, is go into a response strategy and maybe create something that can undo their wrong. Um, to my earlier point about kinds of making a statement, I think it's an opportunity now to continue to build a case to continue to highlight that there are businesses that um, either are not operating well or businesses that even if they are, there's a concern that they too are blind to the realities of the, you know, the source materials that they're using because there is not enough transparency. There are not enough mechanisms to help businesses uh, guarantee unless they're growing it in their own backyard. So I think when it comes to the body shop using hemp, um, They've been using it for a very long time. They've been using a hemp oil in their products, which is you know, from the hemp plants for industrial purposes. It doesn't even touch CBD and THC, so it's, uh, it's on the spectrum, but very different. I would say that highlighting these organizations and getting the media to cover momentum across sectors to not let something like this fall by the wayside, because this type of human trafficking and labor exploitation is important. And so it's a very relevant topic. I'm not sure as a strategy, certainly it's not one that we're going to use when we go to the government. We're not trying to isolate instances of companies. We're trying to shed a light on a new strategy that could potentially afford those businesses and new businesses a better way of practicing. And I think just to add to that quickly, you know, it's not really fair for us to name and shame until we give them the opportunity to participate. So we're going to we're going to strive for positivity. And, you know, as we're in this um, global pandemic, we all know the truth is that modern slavery is an ongoing pandemic that is just it's time for things to be changed as we're rebuilding this new world. So we're going to strive towards a more um, positive and inclusive approach and hope that everyone joins the bandwagon. Amazing. With that, what are your expectations as a little way to round this up? Um, very hopeful, very optimistic, uh, but also keen to hear some of the realistic outcomes um, near term and, and long term as well. Long term, we definitely need to see some traceability, tracking uh, beyond seed to sale, what's going on at the, the source level, where is my cannabis coming from? We need to know that because otherwise 
it's going to fall into the same uh, ill practices of other sectors. And then, you know, with some type of accountability mechanism, whether it's an ombudsman or, um, you know, a, a technology and uh, a certification, a, a third party audit that can actually be done to ensure that these products are, you know, ethical, cruelty free and, and free of all forms of modern slavery. So consumers actually have the ability to vote with their dollars. That's sort of a, a long term vision that we definitely have um, in the near term. We would love to, you know, get people in this um, audience as well as in the industry on board with some of our initiatives. So uh, I believe uh, someone was going to throw in the chat our, our emails and our link to our website, which you can also contact us on the website, because we do want people to join us um, in our working group to write the letter in our petition circulation uh, for the global sector at large and uh, maybe in our education efforts to the organizations that are currently working with migrant communities and as well, you know, potentially factoring this into their research at Oxford. And I'll just say from a timeline, I mean, yesterday would have been ideal, but it looks like for us, um, just to be Canada specific for a minute, there is a group of lawyers who have indicated that in October of 2021, they are asking for a review of the Cannabis Act because they feel that a lot of it is um, harming the operations of the industry. Uh, obviously, our mission is not yet part of it, but it, you know, our efforts are to kind of become aligned with them as well because it's a great way to introduce it. So we're looking from a timeline perspective, short term, we'll be launching our petition in Q1 of 2021, which is aligned with the UN narcotic meeting in March. And then we'll be moving towards um, appealing to the Canadian government in hopes to be considered for uh, you know, review or discussion in October, 2021. Um, and then I guess after that, in, you know, if we stay hopeful that Canada will take the the year or two it takes to really consider this and implement it. Um, and while they're doing that, we will continue on our global mission uh, to maybe work with other uh, countries who themselves would like to modify um, our proposal to our Canadian government and use that for their own governments uh, so that we can kind of have a groundswell. Uh, so we're in it for the long haul, but I'd say that's the three month, eight month kind of you know, two year plan and, and hopefully we can, you know, join you on many more conversations so we can discuss a little bit about the progress and how we're making, you know, micro changes and then, you know, all together make that macro change. Definitely. And for anyone that is a student or researcher within the academic space, I really do encourage you guys to get in touch with Jen and Kelly. Um, I think they're very flexible in how they would work with you or if you're interested in cannabis as a sector, as a topic, I think, I mean, I'm biased obviously because I have been studying it for a long time, but it is so fascinating and just the fast paced environment and the time of reform that's going on and kind of the nascent emerging market that we're experiencing is really, really fascinating. So, and they're doing such incredible work, um, obviously very passionate, very genuine as <laughs> this has come across. Uh, before we put it to a close, there is someone that's raised their hand, so I'm going to unmute them, uh, which is Francis. Let's see if this works. Allowed to talk. If Francis, if you have a question, you are unmuted now. Jessica? Hi. <laughs> Hi, Jessica. No, I didn't have a question. I was okay. actually about okay. to thank you guys for the interesting discussion. I was, I was, uh, I was curious about this whole association with, um, with slavery because you know we work a lot with uh, the country of Jamaica, mm. uh, and uh, I, I, I see. Uh, in Jamaica particularly, I see a direct link between the sugar crop and how that started off in slavery and basically ended up very recently uh, driving the country's economy into chaos because the whole sugar market dropped dramatically from like $900 a metric ton to less than $200 within the space of three years. Um, bankrupting many companies and putting thousands and thousands of Jamaicans um, uh, out of work uh, with the hemp industry 
because there's a big uh, debate in Jamaica about using hemp as opposed to their own indigenous species of um, cannabis, you know? And there's a lot of uh, people want to do hemp so that they can cash in on the whole CBD market in Jamaica. But of course, there's risks linked to that because, you know, to do hemp in a profitable way, because it's now a commodity, you need to be like a China or an India or a United States, you know, to be to be successful. So, so that's that's where I was thinking when I saw the um, the uh, advertisement for your discussion today. But thank you very much to all the speakers. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Okay, Jen, do you just have anything goodbye. to add on, on Jamaica, given that we were there? <laughs> no, ex exactly. You know, Jess, you mentioned that we met when we were in Jamaica. We were there because we were speaking at a conference. And, uh, you know, Francis, I think you bring up uh, an important point. The land race strain that belongs to Jamaica, lamb's breath, has been uh, impacted greatly because over the last decade, um, with the outdoor cultivation and the winds, uh, new varieties like hemp have come in because they're looking to kind of be positioned properly, I'd say, to kind of jump on commercial bandwagons, which certainly CBD is one of them. Um, I would simply add to it to say that one of the challenges that we have seen that Jamaica has had is that because they have not been able to think about yet how adult use can really, or recreational can work into their governance, um, you know, they haven't really been able to create opportunity for the people. And as Francis pointed out, I think, you know, there are parts of the, the uh, farming opportunity, which are very challenging. And of course, the investment parts. Um, what is interesting about Jamaica is that, you know, so much of their um, economic opportunity comes through tourism. And uh, because these uh, the tourists, you know, we come from international markets, especially when you come on uh, on boats or you come on cruises, the, uh, the jurisdictions aren't the same. Who takes the responsibility to actually allow this to happen? Um, you know, it's a very transitional period. Who, who takes the alcohol companies and tells them that they don't have the same opportunity to sell through at... Uh, you know, the, the all inclusives or the vacations. And so I think Francis brought up a great point. There is ongoing impact to all nations when it comes to cannabis, whether that's through the degradation of their, you know, uh, IP that they once had, whether that's the lack of funding to actually educate people and, and onboard them and bring them into a space where they can have a thriving industry, or whether that's from a policy perspective where you know there's just real reasons why governments cannot advance maybe at the speed that they want and that can be their size or the pressure their connection with the fda so i think uh i'm happy that he jumped in it's also a, an indicator that uh you know maybe we've just scratched the surface today and there's so much that we can continue to talk about yeah well, thank you both so much for the wealth of knowledge and insight and the work that you guys are doing. I hope for everyone that attended, they found something useful or of value, something that really triggered your mind. And hopefully you're more curious about this. Um, just to reiterate again, definitely do not hesitate to get in touch with Jen or Kelly. Um, I believe Isabel has just dropped their emails and their links. Um, and yeah, thank you, Lisa, again, for organizing this, but I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Jess. Thank you, Jen and, and Kelly. I mean, I've got so many thoughts in my head now. It's, it's just wonderful to be able to hear from you. Um, just to tie things up, um, if you want to get in touch, um, there is the uh, website links that's been shared in the chat. Um, and then also, you know, just on behalf of OxBHR, I think this is the kind of talk that we really enjoy having. It's just, you know, people who are at the cutting edge and also just new commodities and things like that, that really need addressing. The point that came out for me particularly was the fact that, you know, supply chains are being built haphazardly and very, very quickly. And this is something I don't think we've seen in recent times. There are long established supply chains with modern slavery problems, but you know, the, the risk of having a, a haphazardly built supply chain is, is something else altogether. Um, so thank you again. Um, I would ask just the speakers and, and the um, crew behind the scenes, thank you very much for every, all your help. Um, could we have the cameras go off and allow the participants to go and then we'll have a conversation just very quickly afterwards. Thank you guys. <laughs>